May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As you look back in your lifetime, who were your heroes? Maybe you were listening to thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver. Hi ho, Silver away! The Lone Ranger rides again. Cue the William Tell Overture. Maybe it was, look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. I don't forget the words of that one, I tell you. But I recall Champion the Wonder Horse, or Casey Jones from my childhood in the TV. Somehow, SpongeBob SquarePants and Bob the Builder or Tracy Beaker doesn't quite conjure up the same images of heroes or role models. Maybe your hero was in sport. Maybe it was Colin Steen or John Gregg. Or for the most mis or more misguided, it may well have been Billy McNeil. You can tell I'm winding the clock way back here. My sporting hero was the late Gordon Brown, the rugby player from True. And I remember watching as he was sent off playing for Glasgow after he chased that player halfway around Murrayfield after his head had been stamped on. Gordon Brown retaliated and was sent off. And I remember getting into a debate with our minister at the time in the weeks that followed that Brown had done nothing wrong and he was exacting retribution, an eye for an eye. And the minister was telling me, Abba, what about it turned the other cheek? And I said, I bet Hardy would have stood in that one as well. So imagine my situation a few years later when I was travelling to and from rugby training with Gordon Brown. I even played in the same team as him. And he came and he spoke at the Church Youth Fellowship. It's a pity that that minister had moved on then because that would have been a rare conversation. You'd have done anything for your hero. And in recent times we've taken to parades and cheering crowds for our heroes. Think back to the Olympians. Think back when England beat Australia at cricket. England winning the Rugby World Cup. And I managed to find a Scots parade as well. And that was Chris Hoy in Edinburgh. And so we go on. We celebrate our heroes. We love a parade. And that's what happened 2,000 odd years ago. There were two and a half million people in Jerusalem that day. They had returned from all over the Mediterranean basin for the Passover feast. And this was every victory parade rolled into one. In a book entitled The Last Week, Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan suggest that there were actually two processions taking place in Jerusalem on that spring day. One, of course, was the procession of Jesus coming down from the Mount of Olives from the east side of the city. The other procession, less well known, was a Roman imperial parade on the west side of the city. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, entered the city at the head of a column of 600 imperial cavalry and foot soldiers. The contrast can't be missed. So unspoken in the story of Palm Sunday is that other parade of 600 Roman soldiers entering the city with all the pomp and ceremony that the most wonderful and powerful army in the world could muster. We can imagine what a spectacle it offered, the flags with the golden eagle, the sound of drums beating, the time of the march, the whinny of the war horses, the creaking of leather, the clinking of armour, the glint of spears held high. It must have been an awesome display of power. And Borg and Crossan remind us that it was also an awesome display of Roman imperial theology. According to their imperial theology, the emperor wasn't, the only, wasn't only the ruler of the Roman Empire. He was the son of God. 
the emperor bore the titles Lord and Saviour and was known as the one who brought peace on earth. I think we're picking up the irony here. When an emperor died, he was imagined as ascending to heaven to take his place among the gods. So Pilate's parade was not only a display of Roman imperial power, it was a display of Roman imperial theology. But then there was that other parade, the one we remember today on Palm Sunday. In this other parade, Jesus and a crowd of his enthusiastic followers moved down the hillside on the Mount of Olives on the east side of the city. Jesus, in contrast to Pilate, is not riding on a golden chariot or sitting on a mighty war horse. He is riding on a borrowed donkey, clip-clopping down the pathway with his followers spreading their cloaks and leafy branches as a kind of carpet for him as he enters the city. In today's language, think of this parade as a planned counter-demonstration in contrast to the parade in the other side of the city. The strategy is clear. He was fulfilling a well-known prophecy from the book of Zechariah. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so this event begins Holy Week. The week is eventful and revealing. In it, we can see how the tide of popular opinion turns against Jesus as the week progresses. On Monday, he cleanses the temple of the money changers, and this violent scene provokes the Jewish leaders to intensify the effort to get rid of him. On Tuesday, he engages in discourse with the Jewish leaders and curses the fig tree for being barren clear message to Israel. Wednesday, he was anointed in Bethany, much to the discomfort of Judas. And Thursday, which we call Monday Thursday, he was preparing for Passover, and it was also the evening of betrayal and arrest in Gethsemane, and the beginning of the trials. The crowds call for his crucifixion. Friday, was the day of the crucifixion. Saturday was in the tomb. And Sunday, the day of resurrection, the day of victory. The same crowd, crowds that called Hosanna on the first day of the week cried crucify him at the end of the week. Why? Could it have been because they wanted an instant kingdom and he offered an eternal kingdom? Or could it have been because the crowds wanted entertainment, not enrichment? Or simply, when during the week they saw the demands of his kingdom, they weren't willing to change their lives, much less their lifestyle for him. It's very simple. Jesus resisted any attempt to make his message or his ministry subordinate to the culture to the government or to any other religious group. And as this became clear, the crowds began to melt away. They weren't that much different than we are. A religious commitment that won't support my political view or my economic opinion, that's not for me. Any faith that claims first place in my life is not acceptable. After all, my faith should support me, my world view, and demand nothing of me. We pray, and we expect God to jump. A God who doesn't give us what we want, and what we want now, is of no use. We are impatient. We can no longer wait for anything. We're like the lady who prayed, Lord, give me patience, and I want it now. We no longer have the patience to let character develop. 
or to postpone gratification. For many in our culture, religious commitment is an add-on to our lives, just like a new app on your iPhone. Jesus would not adjust his message to the popular ideas of the Messiah that prevailed in his day. He called his disciples to a lifetime commitment, not to short-term ministry. He wouldn't adjust his message to their whims or gain following by stroking their prejudices. And we, like the crowds on that Jerusalem street, we're no different. God calls us to repentance. We want to negotiate. God says his kingdom is forever. And we say, as long as I need it or can use it. God said, all things are mine. We say, try and get them from me. God stretches us. He doesn't stroke us. And Psalm 118 addresses this in a way that throws light in the events of Palm Sunday. In order to be successful, the psalmist asks for God's help. Assuming that one's goal, motivation and plan are worthy, there's nothing wrong with asking for such help. Jesus repeatedly asked God to help him, most notably in Gethsemane. The psalmist asks on the basis of God's prior help, but the situation has changed. He feels chastised by God. Others have written him off. Why has God kept him alive? It's because he wants him in the camp of righteousness again. Perhaps he had come to believe that God would always bless him, no matter what he did. But the psalmist knows what God expects. He must return to the camp of the righteous. The Lord has provided a gate to the camp. But the psalmist, like all the righteous, must enter through it. Only then will God act. When we do our parts, God will respond. It's not a deal or a negotiation, but God will not help us until our goals and our motives are right. And then, only if we ask. It's interesting how often those who have a good goal and proper motivation don't ask for God's help. We should begin by rejoicing in what God has already given us, including life itself. We should have confidence that God will prevail. We should continue to trust that if we are on God's side, we will prevail as well. Does God guarantee success? Yes, but on God's scale of success not ours. This means that we may lose the game, we may lose our job, we may lose someone we love, but we can never lose God's love. Holy Week invites us to look deeper at our commitment. It invites us to decide. The Bible is sure in its assertion that commitment is the way of faith. It calls our first-rate commitment to second-rate causes into question. For many, our commitment to our favourite football team or political party or members club receives more from us than our commitment to the faith that we proclaim to profess. The Apostle Paul calls us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem invites us to re-examine our understanding of the mission of Jesus and our commitment to him. A hero that we can meet and that we can travel with. And as we see the crowds melt away as the week becomes more difficult and the challenges to commitment become more intense, we must ask ourselves, have we made him king for a day or lord of our lives? Amen.